Now, I was going to finish up the lessons on marriage, but I'm not going to do that because we still don't have a, a kid Sunday school, so I'm going to save that lesson for a later date. We're going to start on dispensational studies now, which is the next field that the pastor wanted me to go into. So please turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And then I would ask uh, Anthony if you'd pray for the Sunday school class, please. Amen. Oh, that's the second point. If, if something happens with you and you need something, as Anthony just said, we're a family. Yes. Reach out to the other members of the church and we'll do what we can to help you. Sure. And I guess the ruse are sick now, so make sure you pray for them. And uh, what's that? Yeah, my wife. She's actually recovering. She has flipped it around, but but she is still ill. But she's her fever went way down, so she's a lot better than she was two days ago. Um, I would also say financially, keep that in mind. Bring your needs to the church. We'll do what we can to help people through things. That's what we're here for. Okay. All right, so 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It says shoe, but that means, that's a word that means show. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this is the only place where you find the word study in Scripture, although it is expressed in many different ways elsewhere. Um, meditate is, is the word most commonly used, uh, which really is studying and thinking about um, talks about reading it and discussing it morning, noon, and night. That's all the way back in Deuteronomy and Exodus. So, you know, we, uh, the Bible throughout its entire uh, body tells us to study the Bible. But this is the first place the word is used. And then the word workman, uh, that means a person who puts real effort, real work, into getting their mind around what the Bible says. At the end of this, this verse, it says, rightly dividing. That means there are divisions to be made in Scripture. Okay? Um, this deals with understanding distinctions in Scripture that clarify the meanings of passages. Okay? And it doesn't only apply to dispensations. There are many things to be divided. Um, Israel versus the church, standing versus state, law versus grace, the various baptisms that pastor covered. There are divisions that have to be made. Uh, the covenants, which he's going to cover this morning, he's going to start covering. The judgments, the resurrections, etc. They're not all one thing. You have to pay attention to the distinctions that the scriptures give you so that you can understand how they fit together. Okay? One of the big mistakes that all millennialists make is they smash all that stuff together. They believe in one general resurrection at the end of time where everyone gets resurrected together. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. And in fact, they've already missed the boat because Christ the first fruits already rose as did some other people. Right? When he rose, there other people rose too. So the first fruits have already risen. So there's already been one resurrection. They can't be right. There are divisions. Okay? And so, uh, but the primary meaning of this verse, and I, I agree with the teaching that, that most dispensationalists give, the primary meaning of this verse is dispensational truth. Because that's something that, that covers the whole scope of the Bible. And without it, you cannot understand your Bible. I'm just telling you, you won't be able to understand it. You will mix things together that do not belong together. You will take commands for one group of people and think they belong to you. That's why we have Sabbatarians today, because they're not paying attention. If you read the Old Testament, when God gave the Sabbath to Israel, He said, this shall be a sign between me and thee. 
It didn't apply to anyone but Israel. Never has applied to anyone but Israel. In the New Testament, we're specifically told that we don't have to observe it. If you choose to, you can. So, it's, that's a change, right? That's a distinction between one group of people in one era and another. Now, um, the set of divisions that we have developed that we call dispensations is driven by two things, two approaches to Scripture that if you don't have these, you won't have dispensational truth. The first is, um, it's an inductive study of the whole of Scripture. Okay, It's not based on one little verse or one little passage. It's based on comparing the whole body of Scripture together at one time. That led to these dispensational understandings. Okay. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, the Bible, how many of you in here believe that the Bible is the inerrant, absolutely true Word of God? And everyone raises their hand, of course. Because we do believe that. We're Bible believers. That's, that's who we are. That's why we're this kind of church. Well, if you believe that, you know that there can be no errors or mistakes anywhere. So if there is a passage that says we are to, uh, to that someone at least, is to stone adulterers, well, then why aren't we doing that? If it's true. Right? Well, because dispensations change. The rules change. Okay? And we're not told to do that. Right? The church is never told to take anyone's life. We're not here to harm people. We're here to try and help them. That's our only purpose. And we're to try to help them with the gospel. So there has been a change, clearly, from one place to another. And that comes from an inductive study. Believing all those things to be true, we know that in Israel, if you were guilty of adultery, under the law, if there were two or three witnesses you should be stoned to death. That is what the law said. And under that dispensation, in that country, that's what should have happened for them to be righteous. Of course, they didn't do it, right? I don't find any account of anyone being stoned for adultery in the Old Testament, you? But there are plenty of cases of adultery, right? So, even Israel didn't do it. I think it probably happened some, but uh, even Israel didn't really do it. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 10. Now we'll start at verse 9, because this is a verse that's often pulled out of its context and messed up. It's not directly relevant to what we're going to say, but it does matter to get the context right. So verse 9, but, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, how many people have, you ever, have ever heard that verse quoted to mean that we, we don't know what God has for us in the future or in heaven? That's not what it means. That's pulling it out of context. Okay? I heard an entire sermon at a Free Will Baptist Church in Oklahoma based on that error. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Okay? So there it is. These are not hidden anymore. Men have not seen it. They have not heard it. But the Holy Spirit has revealed it. And when He did that, it was written down. So now, the things He wants us to know about these very things, now we know. And then He goes on to say, For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not we will someday, we have received, not, uh, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, the Holy Spirit, through that, He wrote this. It's talking about the inspiration of the Scripture here. And how do we know it? The next verse. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So He's saying here, the Bible is written, 
to, to actually tell us things that we can't know otherwise. They're the things of God, and the Holy Spirit gave it to men who wrote it down. And how do you study it? You compare spiritual things with spiritual. He's talking about comparing one passage to another passage. This is why we talk about comparing Scripture with Scripture. If you don't do that, you will mess yourself up. There are very clear passages that teach very plainly certain doctrines. Eternal security, for instance. And then there are other passages that if you don't get the context right and don't compare Scripture with Scripture, they can make you question eternal security. But we know from the clear passages that we have eternal security. So what does that tell us about those passages? That they cannot mean you don't. Because if they did, they'd be contradicting a very clear, plain statement of God. Right? And so that can't mean that. That's how comparing spiritual with spiritual works. God's not going to tell you one thing here and then five pages later tell you that wasn't true. Right? The whole Bible is true, so he can't be saying that. Everyone understand what I mean? That's how comparing spiritual with spiritual works. You can eliminate the possibility that it means something based on very clear teaching elsewhere. This is what inductive study is about. So if it doesn't mean that thing, what does it mean? Then you can dig into the get the right meaning of it. Okay? And so that's what comparing spiritual uh, with spiritual has to do with. And then second, we take God's words to mean what they appear to mean in plain language. Right? We don't try to put an allegorical or mystical interpretation on God's words. They mean what they mean in plain language. Now that means in context. And that requires you to know certain things. Who was he talking to at the time? What was he talking about? You know, in, in 2 Thessalonians or 1 Thessalonians, I don't remember which one, it says, we are not appointed under wrath, but to obtain salvation. That's not talking about being saved from your sin. That's already been done. It's talking about being saved from the wrath of God and the tribulation. It's the same word, salvation. But it has, a, it has an application based on the context. Agreed. That's absolutely right. And that's why defining words matters, right? Baptism just means immersion. That's all it means. It's just a word. It means immersion. It's not always talking about our church water baptism. Some of the passages are. Many of them are not. And so you have to make these divisions and clarifications. And, and so um, when we say we take the Bible literally, and we do, we mean literally as studied through context. What is the topic being covered? Who is he writing to? Because when he writes some things to churches, those things aren't written to unbelievers. They're written to churches, to believers. Everyone understand what I mean? The Bible has only one message for an unbeliever. What is it? That's it. That is it. Turn or burn. That is the only message the Bible has for an unbeliever. We just read... They cannot understand these spiritual things because the natural man doesn't receive them. So the only thing they can understand is that they are lost and undone and on their way to an eternity in a lake of fire if they do not repent and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That is the only message that an unbeliever can get from Scripture. This is why there's no point in talking about doctrine with them. There's no sense in getting into an argument with the Seventh-day Adventist about the Sabbath. He's lost. He's not born again. He can't understand doctrine. You can point him to all the passages you want. He will not get it. Now, of course, most Seventh-day Adventists are committed to heresy. They're self-subverted. They're apostates. And they're not going to listen anyway. And, but if you have a friend who's a Seventh-day Adventist and he does want to talk about these things, I'm not telling you not to. The Bible tells us that you, know, you should have an answer. Right? For every man that asketh. But it also tells us in Titus that after the first or second admonition, if they won't change their minds, reject. And you notice it doesn't say after the first or second argument. <laughs> it says admonition. You're not to debate with them. 
You're not to argue with them. You're to admonish by showing them what the Bible says. They'll either believe it or not. And after you've done that a couple times, no more. You have a job to do, and that's to reach lost people. You do not have time to waste it on a self-subverted apostate who will never listen. Everyone understand? God will deal with them. You can keep praying for them. I don't ever say don't pray for them. And, and of course, if you believe their questions are honest, that they're really searching for the truth, then that's not a self-subverted apostate. That's a person who's really trying to come to the truth. And if that's your sense of what they're doing, then go ahead, stick with it. Show them everything you can. But understand, they, there's only one message to a lost person from the Bible, and that's repent. That is it. And until they get born again, they can't understand these things. So uh, keep in mind, when we say literal, we require that to be taken into context, especially with the full inductive study of Scripture. The best example of this, how many of you have ever seen those websites that have 10 questions to ask a Bible thumper? You ever seen any of those kinds of websites? No, they're out there. Okay, and they, and they think they're so clever. They put these questions out there that, uh, that they think will really knock you off kilter. And of course, unbelievers, they go to these sites and read them, and they, and they think there's something valid to those. There isn't. These are the same arguments, questions, and, and disputes that have been raised for hundreds of years. Um, the, Thomas Paine wrote a book, The Age of Reason, in which he attacked Scripture. That entire book was primarily based on a book by a man named Socinius that had come 400 years earlier and had already been refuted fully. But Thomas Paine didn't know that because he was ignorant and he was lost. So he writes this book, The Age of Reason, which he makes all the same attacks, all of which have been properly dealt with by believers over the previous 300 years. And he thinks that he has really written an absolutely unanswerable argument or explanation for why the Bible can't be true. I've read through Thomas Paine's book. Um, I looked at I, probably the first 15 art things he raised. I studied each one of them in depth. Utter nonsense. After that, I picked and chose. I didn't go through every single one. Some of them I just knew automatically, others I didn't. But, but you know, in a real examination, what an ignorant buffoon. I mean, just ignorant. The things he claimed were just ignorant. And so do these sites. So you'll, you'll run into people who will say, well, if you believe the Bible, you think homosexuals should be stoned. I don't believe any such thing. I believe they should be if they were in Israel. Under the law, sure. That's what the law said. And that was right. But we don't live under the law. And we're a Gentile nation. We're not Israel anyway. So it's not to us. But they cannot separate those things out and understand the context and the time. Okay? This is the key issue with dispensations. That's what, this is what dispensations helps you see. Okay? <clears throat> now, if you take prophecy in the Bible to mean what it plainly says, in plain language, and that means Old Testament prophecies and New Testament prophecies, and compare Scripture with Scripture, you have no choice but to be dispensational. The only way to not be dispensational, and I mean dispensational like we are. I don't mean some various form of it. I mean the straightforward, well-known dispensational understanding of Scripture. That's where you end up if you just take each prophecy to mean what it says. You can't avoid it. If you want to avoid being dispensational, you must allegorize or spiritualize or you know, explain away entire books like Ezekiel or Hosea or Zechariah. You just got to explain them away. They clearly can't mean what they say, <laughs> right? Unless you believe those things are going to happen because they haven't happened yet. All right? And so, <clears throat> again, dispensational truth is a result of men believing the Bible to be absolutely perfectly accurate in everything it says in its plain meaning. That's what, that's what led to dispensational truth. Okay, that's the reason we have it. Now, what is a dispensation? Does anyone know? Period of time? Well, that would be an age or an eon. Dispensation has a little different meaning. It is confined to a period of time, but... Period of time where God is 
So if you have a Schofield Study Bible, okay, turn to Genesis. Go to the very beginning, I think it's chapter 3. No, it's in chapter 1. It's page 5, okay, if you have a Schofield. <laughs> and look at footnote 4. And for, the, for these studies, I will be carrying my Schofield with me because he has vi this is the, the key to why the Schofield Study Bible is so useful. Okay, It's the only study Bible I've ever seen that does such a great job of laying out dispensations. All right, so verse, or footnote four, a dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such dispensations are distinguished in Scripture. Now, I, I will vary what I'm going to teach um, by two points. First, while it is true that most of the dispensations, I believe there are eight dispensations. I think the eighth is eternity in the future. We don't know much about that. And I don't even know if they'll be testing them, but I expect there probably will be. That's just who God is. I would redefine this to say a dispensation is a period of time under which either all of mankind or a specific group of men under God's authority have been given a set of rules and obligations to follow. That's what I think it is. They are all tests in one sense. Men fail it every time. What is the church's mission? What's our test? Right. Preach the gospel to the whole world. The whole world. No exceptions. Have God's churches fulfilled that obligation? No, I don't think we have. Now, I, I want to be clear. I think the gospel has penetrated a lot further than we know. I think it did even from the beginning. We know that because when Marco Polo gets over to China, there had been no contact with China for like 600 years, 700 years. He gets to China, he finds Nestorian churches, which are a form of Christianity, not, not a sound form. But he finds them in every single Chinese city he visits. What does that mean? It means the gospel did, in fact, get into China. But they rejected it for a heresy, and eventually they reject that out of hand and so on. It made it into India. That's where Thomas was murdered. The, the apostle, he took the gospel to India. They rejected it and murdered him. And anyone who believed it wiped their churches out. That's why the nation's Hindu to this day. Yeah, Hindu's just Babylonianism. And so the gospel got a lot further than we think, even in old times. Um, and I think it has penetrated far today, but the churches have not fulfilled their obligation. They've failed. And we're going to fail. That does not mean we aren't obligated to do everything we can to carry it out. We are and we should be. And each church will be judged on its own faithfulness to carry out this mission. Okay? So men's, men are going to fail in every dispensation. That is true. That is really the message, is that men always fail, God always succeeds. That's what each dispensation does teach us. But I don't think the testing is the heart of it. I think it's about a different set of rules and obligations about how to serve the Lord or obey Him. Okay? None of this has anything to do with salvation. Individual, personal salvation has always been, since the fall of Adam and Eve, and always will be, you don't understand? By repentance and faith through which you access the grace of God. And that's it. That was always the case.
Well, that's certainly true. I think God can use uh, even, well, let me put it this way. I have seen God use modern versions, straight out heretics, and sound Christians who had fallen into sin. I've seen him use all three to reach lost people. I don't think there's any absolute rule about that, but I will say this. You really want to reach people consistently, you've got to be walking in the Spirit. God's grace is so powerful it sometimes reaches over our failings and, and gets to people. I know people who've been saved watching Pat Robertson's show, and he's just a rank heretic. That's what he is. He is as wrong as he could possibly be about almost everything he discusses. And even his presentation of the gospel isn't sound. But there's enough in it that I know people who have gotten born again watching that guy's show. I mean, I, I just do. I, most of the, or not most, but many of the people I know closely who are serious Bible believers were led to the Lord by Assemblies of God or Pentecostal preachers. Our own pastor included, David Cloud's another, Kelly Reinhardt's another. I mean, that's what happens. Those guys are heretics. But they teach and preach the gospel, and people hear it, believe it, and get saved. And so our own flaws, I mean, Cal, uh, Spurgeon, let's take him for an example. He was a heretic. He was a Calvinist. He didn't believe in, in dispensations. He didn't believe in an actual thousand-year reign. Okay? He, he was an millennialist, And yet, tens of thousands of people were saved through his preaching ministry. So, we want to be careful saying, you know, what the limits are. But your, your underlying point is true. Do you want to really fulfill the Great Commission? Then you must walk in the Spirit. I agree with that. I, I think that is an obligation for every church member. I don't think there's any of us that can avoid it. And you can't walk in the Spirit if you're sinning. That's what sin does. It separates you from walking in the light. You're walking in darkness now. Because walking in the light is walking according to the Word of God. And if you won't do that, you're sinning. And if you're sinning, you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through you to reach people on a consistent basis. His grace, I think, at times overcomes that, but, but that's just Him being gracious. The reality is, if you want to be a serious soul winner, you must walk with God consistently, daily, every day. You know, stay clean. And that's what will lead you to witness to people. Why would you spend time witnessing to people if you weren't walking with God anyway? Right? When I was living a very fleshly life and I met my wife, I never told her anything about there's my girlfriend. She didn't know anything. She wasn't saved. I didn't tell her anything about God, Jesus, the Bible, or anything. That's shameful. But it's true. That's just what happened. A Pentecostal woman gave her the gospel. Had been for a long time, actually. Um, but followed it up again. And we were about a month out from from being married. I was going to marry her lost. I knew better. I was going to do it anyway. And uh, she came home and or to, the, to my apartment and said, this woman uh, was telling me that she repeats the gospel to me. And she said, can you believe she believes that? Well, then I had to make a decision. I believed that. <laughs> and I had never said a word to her over a year. So you have to ask the question, did I really believe it? Well, I did. I really believed it. But you know what had kept me from saying anything? Anyone have any idea? It's simple. My sin. I was living a wicked life. And I knew that wasn't consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I didn't want to bring those two topics together. Right? Which makes me out to be a giant hypocrite. And I was worried I'd lose her. I thought that if she knew what I really believed about God, she might not want to be with me. You've all seen my wife, right? I didn't want to lose her. <laughs> okay? So, fear, sin, and selfishness. Because I was more worried about what I wanted than her soul. 
think about that for a minute. That's terrible. But I will tell you this, when she asked me that question, there I was. I had no choice but to either take a stand for the Lord or deny it. And I could not deny it. And so I said, well, I can remember this conversation. I was so sheepish. And I was like, well, actually, that's true. And she said, what? I said, yeah, it's true. Jesus Christ died for the sins of every man. And if you'll put your faith in him to save you from your sin, he'll save you. You'll be born again. You'll be a different person. That's true. She goes, you believe that? I said, I do. And she was stunned. <laughs> But I had a Bible, I pulled it out, a uh, Ryrie study Bible actually, and I walked her through the plan of salvation that night and then put it away and thought, oh boy, here we go. And she went back to that woman the next day, a woman by the name of Mrs. Acre, met with her again and she got saved. Well, praise the Lord, right? Best thing that ever happened for me. And so through God's grace, he saved her anyway. There was nothing right about that process. But clearly, she wanted the truth, and she got it, and she believed it. And it changed her life. She turned into a very different person, which was not bad for me, um, because the things that changed were all things that would have been problematic anyway. It's an amazing thing. God wants to save souls. He really does. That's his whole, that he, he says flat out, that's his will, period, that every soul be saved. It's what, it's, I mean, we've read it multiple times, right? First Peter. God is not willing, in other words, it's not his will, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is his will. He will, I mean, he's all powerful, you know. He will work to get the gospel to people. And I think, like in the case of my wife, I believe the reason it happened for her was not because people were right in getting it to her in her life, but because she was a person who wanted the truth without knowing what it was and was willing to receive it, and so God got it to her. And I say that because she was raised to not believe the Bible. Her family believed in just evolution. That's what she was taught in school, and she never believed it. She never bought that. She told me one time, I always knew that was nonsense. All you have to do is look around. There's no way this could just come from accidents. There's just no way. Someone had to make it all. So she had already accepted the testimony of creation, that there was a creator, and rejected all the false teaching that had been given her from her family and from her schooling, which that's how God works. He gives you some light. And if you'll follow that light and accept it, you'll bring more. The Mormons tried to get her, you know, and when she was 16, they got her, uh, she was in a, a school dance team and the, and the dance instructor or coach, whatever she was, was a Mormon. And uh, I don't know what you know about her life, but anyway, she'd had to leave home and so she was alone and this woman wanted to help her out mm -hmm, and brought her to the Mormon church and tried to uh, get her linked up with some Mormon men who were missionaries, and she told me, because she wasn't a believer, she's only 16, maybe 17, right now, she told me, as soon as I walked in, my skin crawled, because I knew this wasn't real, these people were fake, she goes, I could see it on their faces, so she just rejected that out of hand, never went back, well, how did she get that message? Oh, so, I think God... She wanted the truth, but she didn't know what it was. So God brought it to her. Okay, and that's probably what happened with this Colombian lady and, and of course, the young man. Okay, so turning over to Romans chapter 4, I want to emphasize this issue about salvation. Because people get confused, and there are a couple footnotes in the Schofield Bible 
that are worded very badly and leave the impression that salvation was different in different dispensations. But they were not. Remember, those footnotes are written by a man who's fallible. And sometimes we word things poorly, even if we don't mean what it, what it sounds like it's saying. So there are at least two footnotes in the Schofield that, that imply you could be saved under the law by bringing sacrifices and obeying the law. And of course, that's nonsense. So Romans chapter 4, verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, he's talking about Israelites, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God, for what saith the Scripture? And then he quotes to us Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So he's pointing out that before the law ever came, Abraham was saved not by works or obedience, but by faith in what God told him. Now he moves on to David under the law. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Imputation is a judge, uh, a judicial act. Okay, it's God not imputing to you what you deserve. Not placing it on your register of crimes. Though it belongs there. Everyone understand? He's not imputing it to you. Why? Because he's forgiven you. Now, this in context, he says that David is saying, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. What does he mean? They've already committed the sin, but God doesn't impute it to him. David committed sins, did he not? How about adultery and murder? How about multiple marriages? How about not disciplining his children? I say all that not to pick on David. I love David. I think more than any other person in the Old Testament, I identify with him. But I will tell you, he sinned, just like we all do. But God didn't impute his sins to him. He had earned it, but under works, under the test of works, he had earned judgment. Instead, God gave him life and righteousness. That is salvation without works through faith. And that's specifically what, and we know this, because he says it in verse 6. He interprets it for us. This is comparing Scripture with Scripture. In the New Testament, we're given a new piece of information about what David was saying. Okay? So, before the law, you got saved by grace through faith. During the law, you got saved by grace through faith. And in this dispensation, you get saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? Okay, so um, salvation, individual salvation, where your soul and spirit are going to go when you pass on, was always achieved the same way. So this is not about salvation. This is about service and lifestyle and obedience. That's what it's about. All right? And that's important because are we not supposed to live a certain lifestyle and obedience to God? So we must understand what rules apply to us and what rules don't. Now, those that hate dispensations, they believe in them. They just won't allow it to be called that. There's not a, a Calvinist on the planet going to the temple to sacrifice. Why not? The Bible says to. Right, they know that that rule has been set aside. Absolutely. Just what there's, I mean, all of the people that claim to say dispensational truth is a lie, in the meantime, they have their own dispensations. They just don't call them that. Okay? They, get, they put them under other terms. And then they muddy up what the dispensations really are by not believing literally the prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled. Um, now, I will tell you the prophecies that have been fulfilled, they've been fulfilled literally. Literally. 
So we know the other ones are going to be too. Okay? Um, everything that, we, that has been fulfilled to this point, like all of the prophecies Christ fulfilled in His first advent, they were all fulfilled just literally as it said. And Zechariah talks about the king coming on a fool's ass into the, into the uh, city. The Lord did that. He was crucified on the Passover. He rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. Those are prophetic events. What's that? Oh, yeah, the, the sacrifice and, then, and the resurrection is even covered in there. Um, and his deities identified in, in Isaiah 7. I mean, and his virgin birth. So there's no doubt, you know, these are very specific prophecies, Psalm 22 about the crucifixion, that were fulfilled literally as described. They divide my clothing and cast lots for my raiment. They literally did that. That's literally what they did. They divided his clothes, but for the special robe he had, which was seamless, that his mother had sewed for him, that every Jewish young man had been given by his mother, they didn't want to tear it apart, so they cast lots for that. How precise is that prophecy? So we have to expect that those that haven't happened yet are going to, just as they are described. And if you believe that, you end up with dispensational truth. You can't avoid it. You have a rapture. You've got a seven-year tribulation. We'll get to all that later. You have a millennial kingdom where Christ literally sits on the throne on this earth and runs the place. Well, that's going to be something, isn't it? If you like law and order, you're going to get plenty of it. Of course, it won't be a problem for us. But I'll tell you that the people who, who are born during that time, they'd better like law and order because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of it. There's mercy and grace too. Okay, but there will be a lot of law and order. If you don't understand dispensations, you can't understand the book of Matthew. I'll just tell you right now. That book, which is a pivot book of the Bible, critically important. You cannot wrap your mind around the, around the things that are being said in that book if you don't understand dispensations. Okay? So, also dispensations are not always to everyone on earth. The dispensation of law was given at Sinai to Israel, not to anyone else. That doesn't mean pe the people who were acquainted with the rules of the law weren't responsible for not sinning. They were. It simply meant that if you were not an Israeli, okay, or living in Israel as a convert, you weren't responsible for fulfilling all the feast days, the sacrifices, the Sabbaths, all that stuff. Those were all for Israel. Okay? And so that dispensation is actually a situation where God pulled out of the main flow of mankind pulled a man, Abraham, and then through him, Isaac, and then through Isaac, Jacob, and created a nation and gave them a whole different set of rules when Moses came on the scene. But it didn't apply to everyone else on earth. Human government was still in effect and always has been under the Noahic covenant, which I'm sure a pastor will cover. But that human government continues to this day. And what was the purpose of human government, which is one of the dispensations? For man to restrain other men's evil. That's why God instituted it. Is that what our governments have done? No, they have not. They have failed that test madly and wildly worldwide ever since it was first put into place. Governments have done nothing but excuse evil. Support it. Add to it. And that's why judgment is coming on the Gentile nations in, in the tribulation. Because they failed to obey. Okay, so, you will hear some uh, say that a, uh, dispensations is not a Bible word the way we use it. That is not true. And I've heard, you know, I read quite a bit of stuff about these kinds of things, specifically dispensations, because I believe it's, it is so critically important to understanding the Bible that I, I spend some, a fair amount of time on it and have for many years. So, there's a man by the name of Charles Caldwell Ryrie. How many of you know him? He's a Ryrie study Bible, but he also publishes books and other things. Um, and he worked at Dallas Theological Seminary, um, which is dispensational, but now it's a wildly new evangelical. Who knows what it is anymore? But anyway, he, he wrote several books. One of them called Dispensationalism Today, which is an excellent book, by the way, and I recommend it. And then he worked with J. Dwight Pentecost, who is another major dispensational scholar. J. Dwight Pentecost wrote a book called The Coming Kingdom, 
which I st also strongly recommend. Great book, because it shows how the kingdom of God changes and flows through each dispensation. Just, it's just a great study. But anyway, Ryrie, neither one of them will point to the very verse that gives us this word. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And this is the last thing we'll look at today. This, of course, is a huge topic. It encompasses the whole Bible. I'm just trying to give an introduction. Ephesians 1, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, I believe that's eternity future. That's the eighth dispensation. Most people, most dispensationalists don't see the eighth dispensation as a dispensation because they want to see a test and man's failure. They've misdefined what dispensation means. It just means a time period with different rules. That's all it means. Eternity future is its own dispensation. It is, in fact, the dispensation of the fullness of time. Okay? And so, uh, that's the word used specifically, the way we use it. All right? So, don't let anyone tell you it's not a Bible word, like they do with rapture, which is also nonsense. Um, yeah, the word rapture doesn't appear, but caught up does, and that's what the word rapture means. All right? Um, I, I'm going to stop there. I'll continue the introduction next week because we don't have time to cover the other points that I have here. I will say, if you have a Schofield Study Bible, please go to page 5, read the footnotes on dispensations, and go to all the cited uh, Bible passages. Look at them yourself. That's a start of getting your mind around dispensations. It takes time and application of this knowledge before you can effectively use it when reading your Bible. It's not automatic. It takes work. People that think they can just read the Bible and, and understand it uh, with no help, well, then what was the point of God giving us preachers and teachers and book writers, which are really just preaching and teaching in book form? What was the point of Him giving that to us? He tells us in the New Testament why. So we can grow into full knowledge. That's the reason. So um, study it. Use study aids. Ask questions. Um, and we'll pick up with the introduction next service.